My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. We're very glad to have you here this afternoon. This is the first uh, congressional briefing that EESI is holding uh, in this new Congress. So we are very glad to, that you are here, and particularly as we uh, look at this very, very important topic, which has been studied by many for quite a number of years, but it has been slow, I think, to garner the kind of public attention it truly deserves. So we are very glad to have absolutely key people here this afternoon to really have a discussion about short-lived climate pollutants and efforts underway to really look at that and, and find ways that they can really be reduced and really provide huge uh, benefits both in terms of looking at climate but also in terms of providing multiple benefits in many different areas. So to start off our discussion this afternoon, I want to first turn to Laura Haynes, who is the Senior Environment and Energy Policy Advisor for Senator Tom Carper. Senator Carper has long been interested in this important topic, and which you will be hearing much, much more about this afternoon. Laura? Sure. Um, Thank you, and I want to say thank you to EESI, especially Blaze Sheridan and um, Liz Lewis in our office for helping to put this uh, together. Uh, I told Blaze that I, I, this is a great for a Friday, and he should put more of my briefings together. So, uh, And thank you again for letting me to say a couple words. Uh, since coming to the Senate, Senator Carper has been working on legislative efforts to address climate change. Delaware, as you know, is a coastal state and a very low-lying state, I think actually the lowest-lying state in the nation. So we were already seeing the dangerous effects of carbon pollution uh, through sea level rises, superstorms like Sandy, and droughts affecting our agricultural community. As global temperatures rise, we're just going to see more and more of this, and we're going to see billions and billions of dollars of disaster, uh, disaster uh, relief needed, and so this is something that Again, the senator has been very focused on. Uh, we must work together towards solutions. One state cannot curb these emissions alone. National is, as we'll say, global action is needed. Senator Gar Carper has often said we do not need to choose between a clean environment and a strong economy. We can take common sense actions now to address climate change. And that's why Senator Carper has been so engaged in reducing short-lived climate pollutants like black carbon and HFCs here at home and, and abroad. These reductions have climate gains, but also have clean air and economic gains. Reducing black carbon is a great example of a win-win-win sol uh, solution. In 2009, Senator Carper, along with Senator Inhofe, introduced and passed legislation at, that asked the EPA to report to Congress the health and climate risks of black carbon. I think it may be one of the only climate bills that Senator Inhofe is the lead co-sponsor on. Um, from this report, we found that indeed black carbon is extremely bad for our lungs, our overall health, and for the climate. And just a few weeks ago, a follow-up report from 31 scientists around the world concluded that black carbon is the second most important climate forcing agent next to CO2. Fortunately, the report also found that cleaning up diesel, in, uh, diesel engines and cook stoves is the best way to reduce black carbon. These are things we know how to do and to do well. For diesel engines alone, we have developed technology in this country to reduce emissions by over 90%. New engines are required to have this technology, for our existing diesel fleet may be on the roads and in use for 20 years or more. That's why Senator Carper, working with Senator Voinovich, who is the lead there, on the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act, which provides incentives to clean up these dirty uh, diesel engines. This is a great program that is near and dear to, to my heart and to Senator Carper's heart um, because it's the really best bang for your buck and one of, one of your best bang for your buck uh, programs under the Clean Air Act. For every dollar we spend in cleaning up diesel engines, we actually receive $13 back in health and economic gains. Plus now we know there's huge climate gains as well. 
I applaud the administration for engaging other countries on black carbon and encouraging reductions uh, abroad, but want to remind them that we have 11 million of our own engines here at home that need to be cleaned up. Funding DIRA is a simple way to address health and climate change all in one action. We have common sense solutions to addressing other short-lived climate pollutants, just to, uh, but just need a clear market signal for investment and deployment. In addition to black carbon, Southern Carper has been heavily invested in reductions in HFCs in this country and abroad. Seeing the success of the Montreal Protocol in addressing ozone-depleting substances, he believed we could use a similar framework here at home to address the ramp up of HFCs. As the lead author of the HFC title in the Lieber Warner Climate Bill, which was wrapped into future climate bills, he believed using marking for forces could drive the deployment here at home. Unfortunately, as you all know, we were not successful in passing a, a comprehensive climate bill, but we are seeing market signals uh, all across the, the, uh, the globe, like in Japan and Europe, that are incentivizing the de development of HFC alternatives. Even here at home, CAFE standards for greenhouse gas emissions have driven HFC replacements in our vehicles. Again, we should continue our efforts abroad to send a global market signal and again, we encourage the administration to do so through the Montreal Protocol. But I also believe we have authorities under the Clean Air Act to do more here at home. And just some parting words, we, we may not all agree on what is the cause of climate change or maybe if climate change uh, is, is a, a hoax or is in existence. But I think what we can all agree on is the need for greater energy security, for clean air, and the need for economic growth. And a lot of these things we'll be talking about today do all three. So thank you again. Uh, for some of you who are standing over here, if you want to come up here on the dais, please, please feel free to come up here so that you don't have to stand. It's your big chance, right? <laughs> Remember this day. <laughs> could you just why don't, could you just move down so some other folks? Thanks. And I must also tell you that with regard to our topic today, in terms of looking at short-lived climate pollutants, that we should also remember that um, Rolling Stone just did an article. So I would encourage you to take a look at that because, as I said. The issue had not really been gaining as much popular attention as it should, but perhaps this is a harbinger of many more um, outlets starting to really report on how important looking at things like black carbon and methane and tropospheric ozone and hydrofluorocarbons really are and the difference that it can make. So now I will turn to our next speaker, who is Dr. Drew Shindell who is a climatologist with NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, but he is also the chair for the scientific advisory panel for the international coalition that has been established, uh, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition to Reduce Short-Lived Climate Pollutants. That coalition, an international body that was announced just about a year ago, last, it was last February when it was announced at the State Department with its beginning number of international uh, country members. Uh, Drew is, is again, leading, helping lead that scientific um, uh, understanding of that panel for that very, very important international coalition. Drew? Thank you. This one. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And I am going to try to cover some of the key aspects that I think are important about some of the short-lived climate forcers and their, primarily their physical science, but also some of the implications that come from the physical science. And obviously, I won't be able to do everything that's necessary in a, in a few minutes. But uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. So I, I wanted to motivate why we would be interested in climate in the near term, the climate community often focuses on some th target like the year 2100, and that is an extremely important target. Climate damages are, are potentially uh, catastrophic as you move out to century timescales, but climate change is also really happening right now. And one of the 
the lines shown here in this blue is the is the sem September minimum in Arctic sea ice, and people have it has gotten a lot of attention in the press. We know that the sea ice is melting, declining extremely rapidly. About a third of it's gone. But there are a lot of other things that are also happening, and they're happening really at, a, at an alarming rates. One of these is the snow cover in the northern hemisphere. And you can see that in, in just about 30 years ago, in the 1980s, the typical cover was about 9 million square kilometers. In the last few years, it's been more like 3 million square kilometers. And this is a huge enormous change in the planet we're living in now. And I could go on and on, intensity of storms in the North Atlantic, frequency of very hot days throughout the summer, all of these things are already happening right now. Rainfall is shifting, and if you're trying to grow crops, that's really important. So 2100 is obviously a really critical target. We have to keep in mind the long-term change that can have enormous impacts, but near-term climate is also an important thing to be worried about. So climate change, is driven by a lot of different things. Uh, carbon dioxide is the single leading cause of climate change to date. I think that's pretty much unequivocal in the scientific community. Uh, but there are a lot of other factors playing a role as well. And in particular, what we're here for today uh, is to a large extent, these three factors. This is a chart from the last IPCC assessment, which gives the relative impact on the total change in radiation, uh, reaching the Earth versus going back out to space. Uh, due to emissions, so it's not due to concentrations, but emissions, which is really what you know you might make a policy to deal with. How much is coming out of particular activities? And you can see on that chart that the circled ones here are methane, carbon monoxide, and black carbon. The key thing about the three of these particular pollutants is they're all red. They're all leading to warming. Everything on the red red side is warmer. Uh, the total from those three is roughly the same magnitude as carbon dioxide. So these are not just you know, a tiny little piece of the pie. These are, these are important players in the overall climate change issue. And all three of these degrade air quality. And that's really distinct from something like CO2. It's also distinct from the HFCs. And so I'm not going to talk as much about the HFCs uh, because they're a little bit less complicated in the sense that they don't degrade air quality. But the HFCs, some of them anyway, as well as these three, are also relatively short-lived. And that's really the key distinction from a physical science point of view as far as climate. CO2 lasts a long time. It influences climate on very long time scales. These all influence climate on short time scales. So we knew that. Um, that's been you know, kind of in the scientific community for at least a decade or so. And what was, what's come out and become more clear over the last few years is that, if I just go back for a second, is that uh, if you look at these few pollutants here, you might be able to do something really practical about it. So what the goal from some of the recent work has been is to figure out, using current technology, what kind of bite can we take out of those three? There are a lot of sources of methane, like digestion from cows that we don't have a technology to reduce that. So you can't just say it's caused this much climate change, that's how much we could gain if we deal with it, because we can't necessarily deal with it. And black carbon is never emitted on its own, so it's kind of irrelevant in some sense what it does by itself. You want to know what it and everything else that comes out when you have some dirty burning, a big plume of smoke, all kinds of stuff is coming out. So what's been done more recently is to screen all the different kinds of current technologies and figure out what you could actually do if you took those technologies, like we just heard about, the diesel technologies developed in the United States and in use here and in Europe, but not necessarily in use everywhere around the world. What could you do? So I was part of a, of a study that UNEP organized uh, where we looked at about 400 different control technologies. And we came up with the, the answer that a really very small set of these were the kind of win-win um, measures that we're talking about, that, were, that are so interesting that can both reduce climate change in the near term and improve air quality. And about half of these have to do with controlling methane. Methane leads to production of ozone in the lower atmosphere, so it's not directly affecting air quality, but indirectly via ozone is affecting ozone, which includes it's toxic to both people and plants. Reducing methane uh, release to the atmosphere can be brought about, especially in the fossil fuel sector, where we have technology to capture leaks. We have technology to uh, reduce the amount that's vented and flared during extraction. Also, waste management, agriculture, etc. 
The other half of these measures really have to do with dirty burning, incomplete combustion that releases a lot of BC, but a lot of other stuff too. So you can see one of the diesels we just were talking about up there in the upper right. There's a lot of stuff that comes out of these, and that's diesel is one of the key measures where we know we can have a big uh, impact on climate because its ratio of black to organic carbon, one of the other compounds that comes out, uh, is very high. But cook stoves also, you can see a traditional cook stove down there in the lower right, the woman cooking over a three stone fire. And if you substitute for something like this, a more modern cook stove, these have been implemented in Senegal in this example, and that really can change the amount of emission and of course they're far more efficient. The way you deal with most of the black carbon from incomplete, inefficient burning is to make that burning more efficient. So we have a whole list of things with, as we just heard, uh, diesel and cook stove being cook stove replacement being two of the key measures that can reduce black carbon. If you put all of these things together and really look at what you might do to climate, you get results like this, where you, you get a projection of warming, there we go, of warming going you know, just steadily up and up and up, passing the nominal two degree target um, in the middle of the century, really only a few decades from now, and then just continuing to rise. And if you put in place measures to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide emitted, you actually see there's very little change over the next few decades. And in the long term, they're fantastic. They really reduce the rate of, of increase of planetary temperatures, but it takes a long time. So that's really the opposite of what you get from putting in place measures to reduce methane and black carbon, which have this big effect in the near term, slowing the rate. But in the long term, the rate goes back to kind of what it would be otherwise. And it's only by doing the two together that you keep the planet anywhere near below two degree uh, C. So these are really complementary type of, of actions you might want to take uh, from a physical science point of view. Now, I won't go into uh, all of the different results from the scientific literature in great detail, but just one more here is that in addition to that global kind of picture I just showed, from a regional point of view, you get something very interesting, which is that the temperature change, uh, the mitigation of warming when you control black carbon and methane is you know, it's not evenly distributed about the planet. It's a bit stronger typically in areas with a lot of snow and ice because black carbon darkens the snow and ice surfaces. Um, so it has an enhanced effect there, but it's relatively uniformly distributed. When you look at the public health benefits though, you can really see here the avoided mortalities, avoided premature mortalities are greatest in South Asia and in Central Africa, which is where a lot of the cook stoves and a lot of the really dirty uh, diesels are currently in use and, and a similar story with the agricultural yield increases. So it's really those places that go to the trouble of reducing their emissions that take the actions, realize the health benefits via air quality. The climate benefits are more distributed but the health benefits really are local. And I, we've done some economic uh, valuation. We already heard, heard some results on that, that the diesel type of, an, uh, of measures can give you 13 to 1 gains. We found similar things for many of these measures. For the, the methane, uh, there's a value due to the avoided climate change, value due to the health impacts, and value due to agriculture. And this comes out to roughly about $3,500 per ton, with the cost of most of these abatement measures being an order of magnitude less. So just like the diesel, for much of the methane, the value is, is far greater than what it costs to deal with these things. And for black carbon, as we've heard, um, again, the, the value is often much greater. Many of these, in fact, have net cost savings because, as I mentioned, what you're doing is using fuel more efficiently. Instead of having to get, to get lots of firewood to burn in a traditional cook stove, you use far less when you have a clean, modern cook stove. Uh, and your costs actually go down if you can overcome the upfront cost of getting a cleaner cook stove. So I'll just summarize with some of what I think are the key physical science differences between short-lived and long-lived pollutants and the implications of those. Uh, as I said, carbon dioxide lasts a very long time in the atmosphere. The short-lived climate pollutants really affect, uh, really last a, a short period of time and therefore have a short climate impact. The mitigation difference is that these really come from different types of activities. Their carbon dioxide reductions are primarily going to be achieved by switching to cleaner sources of power generation, uh, in large industry transportation, and what we're talking about with the short-lived climate pollutants are really distinct as, 
as you saw when I went through the kind of, kind of measures. The impacts then, is carbon dioxide affect climate on the long term. It's really key for climate stabilization over the long time scales. But the short-lived climate pollutants are really important for the near term because we don't have much leverage via CO2 on these near-term climate effects, which is what I was leading with, is are already happening now. If we want to deal with what's happening now, the only real choice we have are the short-lived climate pollutants. And then, of course, you get all of these, these additional benefits uh, due to the air quality change. Uh, so reducing the implication of all this, to my mind, is that reducing the short-lived climate pollutants is important to those that are already suffering from the impacts, preventing biodiversity loss, which is typically a function of the rate of change rather than the, the absolute magnitude, providing some more time to adapt because the changes would take place more slowly, and of course these associated air quality, health and agricultural benefits. So I think this really calls for not doing these kind of things instead of dealing with CO2, but they're really good societal reasons and rationales for dealing with both of these kind of things. And to put that in a kind of a nutshell, I think the near-term climate via short-lived climate pollutants, mitigating those changes, is really important for our children's generation. Mitigating CO2 is really important for our long-term, our great-grandchildren's generation. And I think both of those are really uh, key. So at the end, we will have time for questions, and I'm happy to go over anything that I certainly wasn't clear about since I zipped through everything. Thank you. Thanks, Drew, because that was covering a lot of information in a very quick period of time, but in a very clear uh, way. And I think one of the most interesting and exciting things is in terms of thinking about actions that can be taken that can deliver benefits in so many ways very quickly, um, which is always something that people are looking for in terms of seeing things that really make a difference right now. So, um, and I want to, do we have, let me just ask, are there any empty seats over here? If so, could you, if you're sitting by an empty seat, could you raise your hand? Okay, um, so if anybody wants to grab those chairs, please, could you just keep your hands up so folks could get there? Okay, and one back there. And there are some other seats up on the dais if you would like to go up there. So now would be a good chance to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, I am very glad that we have UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, uh, co-sponsoring this event with EESI, and I am now very glad to introduce Amy Frankel, who is the director of UNEP's regional office for North America. UNEP has issued uh, reports with regard to looking at black carbon and these uh, short-lived climate pollutants that have been very, very important in helping folks understand the issue. And UNEP has been heavily engaged working with its member countries around the globe in terms of understanding and figuring out how best to address this issue. Amy? Uh, thank you very much. And I don't know if anyone wants to move by the press table over there. There's a little more leaning space if anyone wants to come around. Um, so now it's a real pleasure to be here, thanks to EESI and to uh, Senator Carper's office for organizing this. I think it's, it's a really great turnout. I'm very encouraged to see uh, so many people here. And to me, I'm a very you know, practical person and I love to see this issue coming along so quickly because it's something we can act on now. UNEP actually started this looking at the science uh, with Drew and NASA and others to try to bring attention uh, of policymakers around the world about what the science showed and can we translate that into policy, which is a, a lot of what the United Nations program does. And this has really been pretty rapid in UN uh, policy terms uh, because we started, I think, with an initial assessment, scientific assessment, maybe four or five years ago. And then we launched this initiative one year ago. And as you'll see, we've grown it very quickly um, from just a small group of countries now to about 50 different partners. Uh, so I think clearly there's a lot of uh, you know, uh, realization that this is a, uh, a very important initiative. I was holding the microphone, by the way, uh, not the clicker. Um, so I won't go over this too much because Drew's already covered it, but, um, you know, the point about this is that it's not just about carbon, although carbon dioxide, although that's been the main focus. And the key here is that there are other pollutants that have a huge impact on climate change 
Um, and the news about these, what's so uh, appealing is that the technologies for addressing those pollutants are ones that we have uh, in our hands. Uh, it's also what's helpful is that there's a lot of co-benefits in terms of some of these figures, and these are conservative, by the way, uh, sort of in a range, um, preventing annually over 2 million premature deaths, avoiding at least 30 million tons of crop loss annually. The range, by the way, there is 30 to 140 million uh, uh, acres, so uh, tons rather. So um, these are fairly conservative numbers, and also bringing down uh, the amount of global warming in a much nearer term. I want to point out there are some people, I think, incorrectly say it buys us time, and that's not uh, really the right way to think about it. It's more, as Drew pointed out, that if we take action on these pollutants now, we will have benefits in terms of cutting the degree of warming, but because of the length of time that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere, we also have to take action on that at the same time. We can't wait for that, but the effects are felt sooner. Um, the, these are some of the key aspects, sort of how are we going about this? It's clearly, it's a voluntary initiative. It's not a negotiated document. Um, I think the key of this is really it's action oriented. Again, it's not about negotiating. It's saying, look, these are benefits that we can feel at home. Uh, there's many economic reasons to do this. Uh, we're trying to have a very light governance structure, so it's not a, a big uh, organizationally or institutionally uh, kind of uh, effort. Uh, building on sound science, being very careful that we look at the science as we decide what to do. And what's done here is a very interesting partnership. It's really trying to bring in, as you'll see, many different actors, which is important both for buy-in and to make sure that you know, there's actions taken uh, in every relevant uh, area. Uh, this is a picture, um, second from the left, you'll see Todd Stern, and then second from left, left is my boss, the executive De director of UNEP, uh, at a ceremony with Secretary Clinton um, and Lisa Jackson and others. And these were the first countries to launch the effort um, in the State Department a year ago. That effort has now grown quite a bit. It was rapidly taken up by the G8, then the G20, and really, as I said, it is growing tremendously. Um, this just lays out one of the key objectives of the coalition to raise awareness, uh, to enhance national new actions, so not anything that's already been committed, but new actions at the national regional level, uh, to promote best practices, basically to try to uh, get information out there um, about what can be done around the world, and finally to improve scientific understanding of the impacts and mitigation strategies that's hidden by the slide, but that's there. Uh, in terms of the partners, as I said, th these have grown tremendously. Not only are countries uh, signing up, and you might notice too, it's developed and developing, and there are a number of countries that are, uh, we just had meetings uh, with a number of developing countries in the room who are very interested in this, uh, Latin America in particular. Um, because of domestic issues. You know, if you've got diesel and soot and health issues uh, which are affecting your population, um, there's a lot of other reasons to take action on these pollutants. Um, so uh, we launched it. We now have 27 state partners, including the EU and many non-state partners. You'll see in there, importantly, the World Bank. So, you know, we've got some significant uh, entities that are involved with this effort. Now, the key here to be a member you have to commit to a couple of things. And one is basically you have to commit to taking meaningful action. And there are priorities that the uh, Advisory Council have established in terms of what are the things that really need to happen here. And so to sign up, you're basically committing to saying, yes, we're going to take action and identify uh, some actions domestically and commit to being a, an active part of this partnership. In terms of those initiatives, there's seven initiatives that we have uh, agreed, the, the, the parties who are uh, members. Um, those seven are reducing the black carbon emissions from heavy diesel, and that's one that UNEP is leading with the United States. Uh, you've got uh, brick production, Mexico's leading, and Bangladesh has also uh, signaled an interest in that. Uh, there's a lot of brick you know, production in those countries. Um, landfills and solid waste. Uh, HFCs has been talked about. U.S. has long been a leader on that. 
Um, Nigeria is leading on this issue of oil and natural gas production and black carbon and methane. And then we've got a number of cross-cutting uh, initiatives uh, in terms of national action plans, uh, which will be done uh, for any of the uh, engaged uh, states, and then financing. In terms of the governance structure, I won't uh, uh, sort of dwell on this too much, but it's very light. I mean, it's, it's trying to be very uh, nimble, if you will. Uh, so we've got this high-level assembly, uh, uh, which is ministerial level, a working group, a small steering committee, science panel, and a secretariat. And secretariat is housed in UNEP, where we're basically, it's the support services uh, to make sure that uh, this thing is operating as it should. Um, as I just mentioned, UNEP hosts the secretariat in Paris. Um, there's a trust fund where voluntary contributions are uh, uh, put in. Right now we have about 16 million and growing. Um, and we've heard, again, pledges uh, from a number of countries. Uh, we're expecting some more funds uh, shortly, in fact, we, ho we hope, uh, to carry out this work. Um, UNEP is also, in addition to hosting the Secretariat and working on the science, we're also an active partner on some of the initiatives. I mentioned diesel. Um, we've had a, a long track record on clean fuels and vehicles work uh, around the globe, actually in partnership with the U.S. government. Um, and one of those successes has been working with partners and just an incredible array. Um, and one statistic on that is we've now brought the whole world along to have uh, phased out lead and gasoline in every country of the world except a handful. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, North Korea, you know, and a couple of other tough uh, countries. But we're going to look at uh, that work in a similar way um, on diesel. Diesel in particular uh, is uh, really coming to be seen as a very important area to, to work. So I was interested to hear about the domestic legislation on diesel. World Health Organization um, a couple of quotes there that it affects more people than any other pollutant. Um, the estimates of particulate matter uh, to kill at least 3.2 million a year, recently classified as carcin carcinogen. And I won't get into the science because it's a little more complex than this last slide, but essentially there was some recent science showing that black carbon has much more of an impact, is much more important than uh, previously thought in terms of its contribution to climate change. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, diesel, very important, um, and there's, it's very urgent as well because what was not shown on the slide is the amount of cars and vehicles that are being added in fleets around the world. And we're really at a point where there's a lot of investment about to be made in countries, especially uh, developing countries with strong economies like China where they're going to be adding a lot to the fleet. And this is kind of a key moment in time because once you get diesel buses on the road, their lifespan is going to be, let's say, 30 years. So we're hoping to work urgently over the next five years to ensure that the fleets that get put on are clean, have the right kind of, um, you know, there's a lot of different tools we have in the toolkit in terms of the kinds of mitigation measures, but um, it's fairly urgent that we, we work on this now because otherwise we're going to have more diesel in the atmosphere than, than less. Um, so diesel vehicles is one we're focused on. Um, there's also work on freight and on uh, urban, what, what can be done at the urban level through urban policies. This just lays this out a bit more. Um, the U.S. government's actually leading on the freight component, component. And on the national component, it's really about national policies. What can be done to ensure that the right signals are, are in place to uh, have clean fleets. Um, so that's uh, a very quick overview of what we're doing, and I very much welcome your questions uh, after the end of the panel. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Nancy. And our final speaker will uh, talk from a perspective of the State Department and the whole role in terms of organizing. Uh, helping organize this international coalition, which, as Amy said, was, was launched just a year ago. It was in February when there was this major event held at the State Department uh, that was hosted by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and, and where there were a number of ambassadors present to embrace getting this whole uh, important coalition underway. So I think it is quite remarkable, the progress that has been made. 
um, in this last year and that there is a lot of momentum to really increase um, the, the size and the uh, overall capacity and impact of that coalition. So to talk about that a little bit, we will now hear from John Thompson, who is the Deputy Director of the Office of Environmental Quality and Transboundary Impacts at the State Department. John? Thank you, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to, to be here uh, and talk about this important topic. Um, maybe let me just start. I, I think Drew um, has spoken um, eloquently, I think, to some of the, the scientific issues and the public health impacts. But I, I guess for me, I, I'm thinking about what motivates countries to take action to deal with these short-lived climate pollutants. Um, and an intrinsic concern about warming, and in particular near-term warming, can motivate countries. But there's some other very strong motivators here. Um, and I think some of this work that's done by Drew, done by UNEP, and, um, and other scientists, I think has laid out the very clear potential for public health benefits, uh, for agriculture benefits, uh, for energy security gains, and the energy security comes from a lot of different places. Um, as you capture methane, you can use it as a clean fuel. Um, but I, I think the energy efficiency gains is going to be a common theme through a lot of the initiatives and a lot of the efforts um, through the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Um, you, you see it in, Drew mentioned, stoves, diesel engines, uh, appliances as it relates to, to HFC alternatives. So um, working together to find ways uh, to capture multiple benefits, I think from our perspectives, from our perspective is really just a key aspect of this coalition, I think, um, that countries can see uh, and the public can see direct uh, and compelling benefits from, from the things that we're trying to do. Um, Drew said this as well, but I, I think he was looking at it from a science perspective, and I like how, how he laid that out. But I guess just to be clear, um, this effort, it's meant as a complement. It's, it's not meant as a substitute um, for CO2 mitigation. Um, this is very much a focus, I think, on, not entirely, but more of a focus, I think, on near-term warming. Um, there need to be additional efforts, and there are other efforts uh, looking at the longer term. Uh, so, so these are complementary strategies that need to take place. Um, as it was mentioned, this coalition was launched uh, less than a year ago. Um, Secretary Clinton and Administrator Jackson uh, are at the center of this picture with five other ministers and the head of UNEP. Um, we've made a lot of progress. A, a year is not that much time. Um, I think the good thing is a lot of the things we're focusing on we think are, are the types of activities that can be implemented relatively quickly. But in the time scale, for example, of bureaucracies, uh, of getting other countries to understand these issues, move them through appropriate channels and join, I think we've actually made um, remarkable progress. Uh, with 27 states, uh, the other key, it's beyond just states, I guess, there's some major international organizations who are very heavily engaged. UNEP, I think, play, is playing a very central role, both as hosting the Secretariat, but also working in a number of the initiatives. We also have the World Bank, UNDP, UNIDO. These are countries with, glo these are organizations with global reach. They have a presence in a lot of countries around the world, and they have experience in practical on the ground intervention. So through some of these organizations, we have, um, really some some remarkable capacity uh, on a global basis to affect change. So I think at this point our feeling is the coalition is off to a good start, but I think we also need to recognize um, it is still evolving. Um, there are other countries, there are other organizations uh, that are interested in, in participating, and, and um, the coalition will continue to, to evolve in that way over time. For us, I think, when we look at the goals of the CCAC, um, I would probably just very, very briefly frame them out as um, it's raising awareness, 
um, of SLCP impacts and mitigation strategies. And I, I think a lot of this work that Drew and UNEP have done, they, they can really bring these issues home to countries, that the mitigation actions that they take can have a direct and compelling impact to public health in those countries uh, and to agricultural productivity um, and to energy benefits as well. Um, the coalition, another goal is to enhance national and regional actions. Um, I think it can do that in part through promoting best practices. Um, we've seen um, some showcasing as well of successful efforts, particularly looking in some developing countries, looking at things that work and trying to emulate those, those elsewhere. And I think there's also a focus on um, getting the science right and improving the scientific understanding of SLCPs so that it does inform decision makers uh, in countries to, um, uh, to understand what sort of actions they can take, the policies uh, that they can enact, the incentives that they can create um, that will promote um, rapid action in these areas. And I, I think from my perspective, um, and I, I work in a number of different multilateral fora on different issues from chemicals to waste to air quality. And I, I think this coalition in a lot of ways, it's, it has some similar characteristics to, to things we've done elsewhere, but I, I think there are some, some very unique things about this. Um, the intent, of course, is to accelerate action on short-lived climate pollutants. And it's, it's not to say that nothing is being done. There are things that are being done. But what can we do to make that move more quickly? How can we enable that? How can we build that capacity in countries to understand what the concerns are, what the problems are, and what they can do to move more quickly and rapidly, both to deal with near-term warming, but also to deal with public health uh, issues as well? The idea of the coalition, it's, it's not just a government type of approach. Um, governments certainly are there. We have a lot of governments that are involved. Uh, but for this to succeed, we need more than governments. I mentioned some of the international organizations that are involved uh, that are very much playing a key leadership role and have broad on the ground presence. We also want to engage the private sector, and I think that's key. Um, and some of the initiative areas that, um, that Amy mentioned um, I think we've begun doing that, to start hearing that perspective from the private sector to understand uh, the art of what is possible to affect change here. Um, and we have a number of active um, non-governmental environmental organizations. Um, they help, uh, they bring in creative, good new ideas. And um, I think sort of the theme of this whole coalition um, of being action-oriented, of pushing, pushing for commitment and engagement uh, in getting things done quickly. I think a lot of those um, environmental groups, uh, I think that theme has very much resonated with them. Uh, they support um, rapid action and, and moving things along as quickly as we possibly can. So I think they've, they've effectively brought that perspective into the discussion uh, as well. The nature of this organization, just to be clear, is it, it's voluntary. So the, in other words, the focus here, um, sometimes in international fora, we, we get very, we as governments can get very focused on intergovernmental negotiations. Um, so lots of talk and negotiations of um, specific outcomes um, as opposed to, I think, what this is, which is a more action-oriented. We're very much organized in particular initiative areas, so practically getting people together in particular sectors to work on particular problems and find a practical path forward in the near term. So I think that, to me, is something that's fairly um, unique uh, about this approach. And I think it's, it's voluntary and non-prescriptive. So the circumstances of different countries, uh, of different um, private sector entities are gonna be different. And I think there's an openness here to finding different ways to work towards a common objective of reducing emissions uh, of these pollutants. And I think the motivation here, I've mentioned it, I won't, I won't say much more about it, but this fact that there are multiple benefits 
um, and that those benefits are compelling, uh, to me at least, uh, is very much a strong motivating factor, I think, for countries to, to engage. And I, I think we've been successful, and I think we'll continue to be successful. I think you have very practical and focused and action-oriented um, initiatives organizing this. We also have access and a lot of at high-level attention to this. We have ministers who are engaged on this. So we have some, a lot of bottom-up, good technical work, action-oriented work going on. We also have a lot of engagement from uh, high levels, from ministers who can make things happen in countries, sometimes a lot faster than a person like me working with other countries can. They can send that political message. Um, so I think, I think that's something about this coalition um, that we think can really help make it effective. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the initiatives themselves. Um, and I just want to say on this, um, State Department is working very closely, in particular with EPA. Um, EPA is actually uh, leading or co-leading a number of these initiatives. Um, so I want to give due regard to, to our partners there. Um, I'm not going to walk through all the initiatives, and in fact, Amy talked about the diesel one, so I'll, I'll jump through that pretty quickly. But just to mention a few of the things that are going on. Um, first is this um, initiative in municipal solid waste. Um, landfills, emissions from landfills, they account for about 11% of global methane emissions. So we're talking about something fairly specific here. This initiative is, is trying to take um, a pretty comprehensive and holistic look at this sector of municipal solid waste. Um, there was some discussion initially, a lot of people framed it just in terms of perhaps methane recovery from landfills. Um, I think the concept has broadened since then because a lot of the actions that you might want to take, you, you can't necessarily sort of telescope it down just to that one thing. There's a lot of work, um, broader work going on with municipal solid waste and how do you, how do, you do that in a, a developing country context in a sustainable way? And what type of actions can we take um, that are really focused and targeted um, that broadly help effect change? And I think we're talking about methane and black carbon here. So looking at landfill gas recovery, waste diversion, um, open burning, which is a huge issue in a lot of developing countries. Um, in fact, we hear that not just in this coalition, but many other places. Um, the organization is primarily focused. Uh, it's a city focus, and we have pilot cities. Uh, there's about 10 that we're looking at right now uh, to begin uh, working with. Um, Accra and Ghana, Rio de Janeiro uh, are a couple of, of the starting cities. Um, there's a number of others as well. Um, these are large cities that have real um, significant waste problems. Um, and there's, there's real opportunity to affect change um, in a lot of these countries. But it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen without um, some specific efforts and interventions uh, to enable that. So a lot of the work is being done. We have some good partners here, C40 Cities, uh, the Clinton Climate Initiative, the Global Methane Initiative um, is doing a lot of this work, and the World Bank. Uh, there's some efforts to pair cities, um, so in fact, uh, some U.S. cities, perhaps New York City, may end up working with some of these um, uh, cities overseas to talk about the systems they have in place and how they can be replicated, um, recognizing, obviously, circumstances are not um, identical. So let me move on to an initiative area dealing with oil and natural gas production. Um, Vented and leaked methane from this sector accounts for somewhere in the vicinity of about 20% of global methane emissions. Um, this is an area where we're, I think, this effort is still evolving. Um, we are making some strong efforts to reach out to the private sector, again, on a voluntary basis. Um, we've had Already we had 13 partner ministers sign a statement to reduce venting. That's an example of a high level political commitment. Um, we get ministers to come in and agree to really take action on this that hopefully translates to, to change 
um, on the ground eventually. And I, I think for those who are familiar with it, the Global Methane Initiative, uh, the Global Gas Flaring Reduction Partnership, we're going to be drawing on those types of organizations, expertise at places like EPA and elsewhere to try to enable changes uh, in this sector. Now, I, th I think in the interest of time, um, I will just briefly mention, I, when I think about heavy-duty diesel vehicles and engines, um, I tend to think particularly overseas and in large emerging developing countries. And I, I think this is really a concern and something needs to be done because what you're seeing is rapidly growing heavy-duty um, diesel fleets. Um, so a lot of large trucking, uh, we're seeing very rapid expansion there. Um, and I think Amy said it well, the question is, um, or the best time to make an intervention is before a lot of this growth takes place. Um, once a lot of these trucks get on the road, um, it becomes much, not to say you can't do anything, there are things you can do, um, but if you can get in ahead of time and affect change, um, in a lot of ways that's the most cost-effective cost and, and best way to, um, to affect change. Um, so the last initiative I wanted to mention is on HFC alternatives. Um, so HFCs are fluids. They're used in um, cooling and uh, refrigeration applications and for foam blowing primarily. Um, they're very potent uh, greenhouse gases. Um, their use is growing rapidly. Um, they're primarily alternatives to substances, ozone depleting substances being phased out under the Montreal Protocol. Um, this just, I don't need to get into the details and you may not be able to see it, but the, the first bar down here is 1990. And so basically we didn't have any of, of this or very little of it going on back then. And then by 2002 you see significant growth and by 2010 this is where we are now. Roughly speaking, this is, this is less than 2% uh, of total greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, you know, even with this growth, it is, it is not um, at a particularly high level yet. That said, annual emissions are increasing by about 10 to 15% per year. So we're seeing very rapid growth in these sectors. Um, refrigeration, air conditioning, foam blowing, solvents, a number of these other applications. And this is sort of the perfect example of trying to get in and affect change before um, there's widespread use of these, these chemicals. Now, obviously, there is some use, um, but there may be some areas where we can really make a difference um, and, and avoid uh, the rapid ramp, ramp up. So um, this initiative on, on HFCs, it's been going for less than a year, but we've already done a number of things. We've hosted a couple of technology workshops, one in Bangkok last year, um, one in December that was focused on commercial refrigeration technology, which is a particularly um, uh, promising sector. Um, we're also conducting a number of case studies to try to put out information about specifically what countries can accomplish in different sectors, commercial refrigeration actually being another one that's particularly promising. Um, we're also working on inventories with key countries. Um, Indonesia, for example, Colombia, uh, Bangladesh, not only to understand what, what their HFC use patterns are now, but to understand what the projections are in the future and, and what the potential is to avoid the ramp up in their countries that is projected. And I think that's the key thing about this coalition um, is I think ultimately that's what the focus is, is to find a way um, to work together on a voluntary basis um, to scale up activities um, that really will make a meaningful difference. And I think with HFCs, if I looked at Indonesia, for example, probably the use patterns right now are, are moderate. They're growing rapidly. So can we head that off? What can we do to head that off? So just to wrap up, um, in terms of next step, I think the coalition is still evolving. Um, what we really want to do is to focus on implementing on the ground actions and affecting change, real world change. Um, we've got a number of initiatives that are launched that, that I think have good potential. We're looking at some new initiatives like in agriculture. We need to recruit new partners. 
both countries, but also particularly, I would say, the private sector uh, to get private sector engagement. Um, also colleagues, of course, from civil society. Um, a focus on awareness raising and outreach, and I, I guess um, maybe just to say again, coming back kind of to the beginning, a lot of the basis for what we're doing here and the compelling argument for action, it, it starts with the science and the on the ground facts about the multiple benefits uh, of these interventions. And I think Drew and colleagues, um, some of the work uh, that they've done, we have a science panel in the CCAC. Um, it's a lot of, uh, I think, creating that body of knowledge, um, working with countries, working with policymakers, decision makers, working with the private sector to understand what those benefits are, what the policies are that can affect change, and to have a full understanding of what those benefits are. That's, that's what we think uh, the coalition can do. And we're going to continue to, to work with partners, uh, with our colleagues at UNEP, with other countries, the private sector and international organizations to, to try to, uh, to maximize the benefits and the progress we can make on near-term warming with this. Thank you. Uh, th thank you for going through and explaining that and in terms of taking a look at some of the initiatives underway. Let's open it up now for your uh, questions and if you could please identify yourself when you ask your question. Okay, we'll start right here. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Juan Pablo Suena. I come from the Senior Institute for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, can I ask you questions? My first question would be, there's been a lot of uh, Discussion about the, the net effect of some of the policies reducing black carbon and 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 like just improving the fuel efficiency, the burning efficiency that made, uh, related especially to two other substances. Most of the policies, uh, most of the measures that reduce black carbon reduce also in NO2, which is a, uh, it, ha it has a, a cooling effect. Um, I've, I've read in some part places that the effect is not, not, not equivalent and that in general the, the, the global effect of reducing both NO2 and black carbon would be just uh, a cooling effect. But I've also heard, I've also read in some other parts, in some other studies where, for example, in India and things like that, where they, they actually measured the reduction of black carbon and NO2 and the overall effect was, was uh, uh, a warming effect. So I'd like uh, Dr. Dr. Sindel to just maybe elaborate a bit on on, on the net effect of of those of those policies, considering also NO2, and you mentioned also uh, improving the, the the fuel efficiency and the combustion efficiency, and I would like also to just bring to the table the fact that then you're turning CO CO2, <laughs> so that would also have a warning. So in general terms, just what, the, what your impressions are on the, on, the, on the whole picture. And my other question is more related to policy. Um, a good thing for people in Latin America, a good thing <laughs> about CO2 is that um, the countries with the money are willing to pay for CO2 reduction in Latin America and in developing countries because it's a global effect. But you just showed us a couple of um, Dr. Sindel, you just showed us a couple of uh, images where we can actually see that the, the effect is a bit more low. So maybe if UNEP or, or, or Dr. Thompson would like to um, elaborate a bit on how you envision uh, an international cooperation policy considering that for this particular short-lived climate pollutants, there's going to be more interested, more interested in reducing your own <laughs> like the U.S. is going to be more interested in reducing its own emissions, and Colombia is going to be interested in reducing their emissions. And um, so, uh, how do you envision a, a, an international cooperation in this sense? Okay, thank you. Uh, George, you want to start? So, it, one of the one of the key issues in the science, and one of the reasons there's been so much uh, recent activity, is because of this mixture of data. So while it was clear just from the you know, IPCC kind of assessment, if you could magically pull out black carbon on its own, great. Um, 
practical question is what you can do. And that's, it's really a question where all we can say from science is probably the they can't give a definitive answer, but the main thing. Uh, we can say very clearly for methane where there are no offsetting effects for climate potential, unequivocal, uh, cool. When it comes to black carbon sources, there's really a hierarchy of sources. And that's one of the reasons I think that diesel has been such a prime target, is because that has the highest ratio of warming black carbon to potentially cooling carbon. But that's still a really evolving area of science. And I think we can present a high confidence diesel measures good reason for the benefits. When it gets to some of the others, the health benefits are very high confidence, but the, the confidence in the climate benefit becomes it becomes less clear. It's still probable probabilistically, it's still probably a good thing. Um, and from a health point of view, it's definitely a good thing. So I would argue that overall it still makes sense. Um, but it's not so clear. And then I will just before switching to the policy, and the one thing that we that I tried to show is that while many of the health benefits were really localized, the climate benefit was still more spread out than other the world. There's some localization and still quite an area of discussion. Um, but I think that for the developing for the developed world, if there's an investment in financing communication issues with developing nations, they might do that because of the climate benefit more globally, whereas developing nations might certainly have a higher priority on the more local health benefits. Uh, I just saw the, the scientific information on black carbon. I would like to direct you to the International Global Atmospheric Chemistry Project that came out January 15th, so just, I guess, last week or two weeks ago. Um, they, it was a four-year study with 31 scientists across the globe looking at this issue because black carbon, there has been so many uncertainties. And again, they have said that car black carbon is the second most important individual climate warming agent after carbon dioxide that's quoting the report. Um, and they do focus on cleaning up diesel and cook stoves. Those two items are, if you do address those, that you are having um, a, a, a global warming um, benefit, if you will, so, or you're countering global warming. So those, if you are targeting cleaning up diesel and cleaning up uh, cook stoves. So again, as, as Drew said, the, the science is evolving, but I think there is a coalescing that, that at least if you address diesel and cook stoves, uh, you will be having a, a net benefit. Um, yeah, I just want to add um, to the second question. Um, well, first, what we haven't talked about at all, and it's, it's complex, um, but the Arctic is one thing I wanted to raise, which is black carbon has also been identified as a key pollutant of concern in terms of Arctic impacts. And in that case, um, in fact, most of the black carbon in the Arctic countries comes from Russia. Um, and, uh, well, and, uh, most of it comes from Arctic Council countries, which are eight countries around the Arctic Circle, but Russia has the most. And so that's having an impact, you know, on other Arctic countries. So it's not just uh, within the boundaries, let's say, of a particular country. Um, but then, as Drew was pointing out, I mean, there's many reasons why countries will be interested in seeing other countries take action um, in terms of global climate impacts and localized impacts uh, because of security issues you know, conflict avoidance and so on. If, for example, there's more direct um, uh, black carbon, let's say, uh, and soot impacts on snow and issues of reflectivity and you know, quicker loss of um, those sources, that's going to raise a whole suite of other issues in terms of water, you know, conflict, et cetera. So there's many other motivations for action globally. Um, which is, I think, is why this is taking off so so rapidly. Um, and obviously, we've been seeing really huge changes in the Arctic in terms of the impacts that um, that's been reported over and over again in terms of how quickly um, we are seeing warming there, glaciers disappearing, glacial fields, ice fields disappearing, etc. 
Um, did you want to comment or add anything else to that? Okay. Um, other questions? Okay, right here first. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, I guess I think a couple thoughts on in terms of, um, I mean, I think you're asking a resource question about the U.S. government and what what we're what we're doing and and how we see the future. Um, I think there's a couple answers to that. I think there's been a fairly extraordinary um, commitment. Um, I think to. Um, to make efforts to, to organize this coalition um, by um, a number of different governments and international organizations. And I, I think the U.S. has been, you know, at the center of that. And I think both at state and particularly our colleagues at EPA, um, if, if you look at a lot of the activities that are taking place, in nearly all of them, there's, there's uh, um, a significant level of U.S. engagement. So I, I think we're, uh, we're fully committed to engaging and helping out. I think it's kind of a mix. There's some areas where we have an enormous amount of domestic experience and expertise that we can share with others. And I think there's some other areas. I mean, one of them that I might give you as an example would be brick kilns. Um, certainly we have some expertise in that area here. Um, but there's other areas uh, of the world, um, and Mexico in particular has um, a wealth of experience in how to do that in a developing country context. So I think from a resource perspective, we've been very heavily engaged and will continue to do so. Um, we've provided a significant amount of funding um, and would intend to, to continue to provide financial support as well to the coalition. Um, you asked specifically about sort of a domestic commitment on SLCPs, and I don't we're not really doing that in the context of, of this. I, I think the focus here is on how can we work together, again, in a voluntary context to make real and significant progress. Um, and so I, I think that's more the mantra and the mindset here as opposed to exactly an, another paradigm uh, of talking particularly about domestic targets and those types of things. There are other fora where those discussions take place and, and can take place. Um, this is more of an action-oriented, on-the-ground uh, type of approach, I think, from our perspective. So I think that's, that's where we come from. Um, you know, I'm not really sure in terms of could this model be used elsewhere? Um, maybe. Um, I don't know. I think um, there are some aspects of this that I think are particular both to near-term warming and the multiple benefits that make this particular type of intervention we think will be particularly effective. So uh, I'm not sure I'd, I would be cautious just to sort of use a one-size-fits-all approach. That said, you know, there are elements of this that are, that are probably, um, um, you know, applicable to, to other problems, not just climate change, but other areas, um, you know, engagement of the private sector and international organizations and, and key countries in a very um, focused and, and action-oriented uh, type of approach. Um, but I think, I think overall we think this model works well here. I'd be hesitant to, to draw too many conclusions beyond that. Thanks. Or do you want to say anything in addition? Okay. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay. Over here first and then back.
could send a letter or something like that to raise it. Just, I guess, talking about black carbon, um, power plants are not a huge source of black carbon. They are a huge source of SOx and NOx and mercury and and CO2. Um, I would assume burning oil will probably be some black carbon from there, but actually, yeah, not, not very much. So that actually, when we first started uh, addressing this issue in 2009, I thought power plants would be a bigger part, but actually um, it's more incomplete um, combustion of, of more your, your diesel engines and um, your older diesel engines and um, um, cook stoves and burning wood and, and such. So uh, for this instance, I would be interested in knowing what the uh, DC state implementation plan would be and, and how that, you know, how that would, you know, that's, again, that's, that's more looking at uh, particulate matter, uh, national ambient air quality standards and, and such, so not quite this issue. But I'm happy to talk to you after, uh, after this meeting. Great. Okay. Um, there was a question. Okay, go ahead. Well, I'm actually an uh, internet connected. I'm doing my master's thesis uh, in greenhouse gas emissions. And I was uh, exploring uh, different designated practices, such as uh, different cabinetry for reactors being used all over the world. And I was wondering if you guys could shed some light on the role of these regional, for regional and local programs and how they relate to. Is there any particular challenges or advantages that you guys have? Basically, go, go, go ahead and, I, I'm sorry, go ahead and, and can you say it again really quickly yeah, so that, yeah. If you guys have found any sort of pros or cons that you think have to create programs as Right, because you have, you're specifically looking at the yeah. at, at Reggie, right? Okay. Yeah. I can uh, talk about HFCs um, in the language that we put together. We looked at the CFCs and how effective the the market for using market forces there uh, in Title, uh, I believe Title Six and the Clean Air Act to reduce CFCs in this country has been very effective. And so we kind of carry that on to um, apply to HFCs. Uh, you're dealing with uh, similar, the, the same constituents really. And so we felt it was a prime, you know, uh, the, the constituents are used to that, that market. They're used to uh, uh, trading. Um, and so we felt it was a perfect way to kind of carry on what is existing now to address a, a more climate centric pollutant rather than an ozone citric pollutant. So that's probably a great example here at home. Uh, we um, also use uh, the acid rain program uh, for SO2 uh, for power plants. Um, uh, that has been one of the most effective climate, uh, excuse me, um, clean air programs. Uh, I think the original, co the, the end costs and time frame was uh, we got it done half the time that we thought we would and at a fifth of the costs. 
So again, that's a great example of um, you know why I think there has been inclination, inclination for my boss to use uh, cap and trade for power plants to reduce CO2. Um, of course, there, the Kyoto Protocol really built on what we did with the acid rain program because it was so successful. Um, and um, I'll let others talk uh, more about that or other 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 cap and trade programs. Uh, I think it makes sense to trade emissions in one location versus another because they really do have the same impact. But I think if you were to extend that to something like black carbon, you would run into the challenge that emissions in different places don't necessarily have the same impact. Emissions near, say, a snow or ice covered region can be much more important. Or, you know, emissions in a place where it rains a lot will not stay in the atmosphere as long because they get washed out by the rain. So it's really different in different regions. And then the most powerful effect of black carbon uh, is this strong influence on human health. And I think it would be ethically very difficult to work out an equitable way where you'd say, oh, well, in this area, we just feel like it's, uh, it's too expensive, so a lot of people will die here, but it's cheaper to reduce them you know, over, over somewhere else. So I think that it, it doesn't make so much sense. It might make sense in, a, in sort of a small area, like California has regulations to lower its BC or a single district or a city, but internationally, I think that that is probably not a useful way to go with the black carbon measures. And just to echo that, when we were um, dealing with several of the comprehensive climate bills, we found that as well. And black carbon, uh, we had worked to put black carbon in there as more of a um, an offset or mitigation. It was kind of an additional on top of. Um, the uh, cap and trade program that was was in place. So, kind of, either you could do it on top of what you're doing, or you know maybe have an alternative compliance. Um, and we already do alternative, you know, kind of uh, with um, with settlements here at, at home with our power plants. Actually, uh, dealing with PEM, we um, power plants sometimes do additional, you know, part of their settlement. Uh, instead of paying a fee, they may put in money into cleaning up diesel to account for all the PM that they've been putting up in the air. Kind of a, a, a kind of a, a co-benefit there. So that's you know we kind of already done this that in in this country. So okay, we have some hands over here. Why don't we take all of your questions and then we'll try and answer them all together. Um, we'll start here first. Sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Susan Annenberg from the U.S. State Department and U.S. EPA. Um, I was uh, an author on both the U this UNEP report and the um, EPA's Black Carbon Report to Congress. And this is really more of a comment, actually. I just wanted to mention that um, we found in both of those reports that of the Black Carbon mitigation measures available today, clean cook stoves would actually have by far the greatest health benefits. Um, and so there's, a, there's an effort underway to address cook stove emissions through the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. We're lucky to have uh, Sumi Mehta from the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, so I'll just let her comment on that uh, effort. Um, hi. So just, just to add, I mean, I think um, on behalf of the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, I wanted to just note that we're very, very pleased to be part of this coalition. It's amazing how much work has been done over the past year. And I just wanted to emphasize to people, because I think um, there's appropriately been given a lot of attention to both the diesel and the cook stoves part of this. Um, but just to let people know that within the coalition, this real effort to engage um, really internationally across both the North and the South, I mean, we're actually in the process of finalizing now um, across the different um, countries and members um, the work on the proposal that's going to be related to, um, to cook stoves. But this really includes not just the cook stoves in the Global South, but also the heating stoves in the North, which are also quite responsible for a lot of emissions that have very important local impacts. So um, look forward to when that's being finalized.
recently. My question is about the kind of advisory support you might be seeking. Um, I was at an institute event five years ago, uh, right here, and with the United Kingdom, and uh, we talked about uh, dangerous climate change and the uh, possibility of that going irreversible and unmanageable. And at that time, based on uh, calculations by California IPCC scientists, NASA, and Harvard, uh, about six gigatons of climate pollution were needed to be reduced within a decade. Uh, today, based on uh, what I've seen, uh, the recent information from Jim Hansen and other scientists, about 18 gigatons. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's about 12 million green buildings with a 40% reduction. It's about 5 million commercial green buildings in the U.S. And uh, I'm, my question was, would uh, strategic uh, planning for adoption of your mitigation measures, which obviously are political, um, I'm not sure if there's a lot of manufacturers here like HFC manufacturing, sure you want. Um, would it be useful to point to uh, due diligence released at the New York Stock Exchange that talks about the growing damages from climate change? Uh, uh, both the United Kingdom and the Bush II White House talked about uh, damages in all sectors, um, and more recently we're seeing systemic uh, financial risks in many markets, especially insurance. Uh, there was about $400 billion in damages last year. The chief risk officers pointed out that uh, if it keeps going, it could be the end of insurance. That's 10% of GDP. The capital markets can't function without insurance. Um, so my question would be, is that kind of information as part of your uh, strategic work, maybe with uh, your partners and advisory groups, uh, worthwhile? Maybe each one of our speakers would like to comment briefly. Or not. As a case of You know, I think that always makes sense of, of, you know, having, bringing everyone in the tent. When you mention the HFC producers, actually they are supportive. Oh, that's good. Um, and partly because they're wanting to move on to the next thing. And, um, uh, you know, there's a little company in Delaware called DuPont, you may have heard of. Um, and, uh, you know, they're already working, they already have uh, developed, and we have developed actually in this country, the alternative to HFCs. Uh, we're not producing it here, again, because we don't have the market yet. So, um, you know, I think thinking, again, a lot of these things are working with businesses and working, you know, putting the market signal out enough time for us to, to to get there, and hopefully um, encouraging um, the 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 manufacturer and the jobs and or the you know changing buildings here. I know Honeywell has been big on that. Um, you know, trying to bring bring all that together. So, um, I, I'll just add uh, two points. Uh, one <clears throat> on the cook stoves. Um, now we didn't talk too much about it, but UNEP is a partner in the cook stove. Uh, initiative, and so we're very supportive, of course, of, of those actions. Um, on the uh, how to get involved, I should have said a little bit more about this. First, of course, you know, um, looking at we, we've highlighted some of the benefits in terms of the avoided costs, uh, but I do think it's compelling when people start to look at you know the hard economic data in terms of why this makes sense, whether it's you know CO2 or, or uh, any of these short-lived climate pollutants. So uh, we'd welcome that kind of data. And in terms of getting involved, as you could see, there's quite a lot of opportunity to be involved with this initiative, both you know, in terms of the science panel, but we also have what we call non-state partners. And so if you are an entity, whether it's a business, uh, you know, a private company, um, an NGO or other scientific organization, there's an opportunity to, to come on board. So please, uh, if you'd like to talk to me about that later, go up to our website. Uh, there's definitely an opportunity for that. John or Drew? Okay. Go ahead, Drew. Just the only thing I would, would add there is that we, you know, we did, in the numbers I showed, we tried to include some valuation of climate damages and different, different pollutants and different time scales. And of course, this is really very dependent on what you assume about the value of damages in the distant future versus the near future. So I don't think there's any real agreement on that, but there's certainly been a lot of work to take that into account. When you get to something like this emissions gap and having to reduce, say, 18 gigatons, 
virtually every projection produced by the people that make these kind of scenarios of what carbon emissions are likely to do assumes that, at, that uh, GDP throughout most of the world increases and therefore pollution is controlled. So this is already an assumption there and by doing the, taking these aggressive measures now it makes a big difference in how you get to that point. But that point, achieving a low, you know, clean air world is already assumed. So it doesn't help you reduce that 18. If you were to make the opposite assumption that this is never going to happen, then unfortunately your gap is even larger. Um, and then this would help, but yeah, you'd have a longer way to go. Another sobering thought. Um, and I also want to say thank you for raising the specific cook stove. Um, uh, issues and I also know that there is a design decathlon underway with regard to designing ever more efficient wood burning stoves uh, because recognizing uh, the importance that that can make both in terms of improving efficiency and really reducing uh, soot black carbon from from that source as well and so we would be very very interested to look at sort of the progress um, over the course of the next several months and this next year in terms of the kinds of actions that are taken and what we're seeing in terms of success stories. So I want to thank all of our speakers. This was really, really informative. And thank you all very, very much for being here. And we hope to see you on Tuesday at a briefing that we're doing looking at renewable energy, what's happening both domestically and internationally and why. Thank you very, very much.